So we have the privilege of hosting Professor Meredith Hughes. Again, she's been our speaker before. Um, Dr. Hughes studies planet formation by observing the disks of gas and dust around young stars using radio interferometers. Her research investigates the structure and evolution of circumstellar disks across the evolutionary sequence, the primor primordial protoplanetary disks around main uh, pre-main sequence stars that set the initial conditions for planet formation, the tenuous debris disks around main sequence stars that probe the gravitational potential of mature planetary systems. Okay, Dan must have written this. It's just way too many big words for me to speak in, in one continuous sentence. Uh, as well as the transition disks that exhibit properties intermediate between those two evolutionary endpoints. She holds PhD and master's degrees in astronomy from Harvard, a bachelor's in astronomy and physics from Yale, and was a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley before joining the faculty at Wesleyan in 2013. So please welcome Dr. Meredith Hughes. All right, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. So uh, yeah, it's lovely to visit you guys again. I was looking back through my notes and also remembering that the last time I uh, visited the Westport Astronomical Society was in person in pre-COVID times in 2016. So it's uh, it's been about eight years and I'm sure that that's the case because <laughs> this is a little bit of a funny story, but um, I remember it was shortly after my older son was born, who's now in second grade. And I was still pumping milk. And so now I get to tell everybody that right. the weirdest places that I've pumped is in an old Nike missile, missile silo, <laughs> um, also a nuclear magnetic resonance lab and a hundred year old observatory, which is where I work every day. Um, so uh, anyway, I have, I have happy memories of visiting Westport Astronomical Society, and I'm just delighted that you guys have invited me back to uh, speak to you again tonight. So I always like to start off with um, two pictures. Uh, one is a picture of the science that I do. And by the end of the talk, you'll understand a lot more about this image here, which is an edge on debris disk around a nearby young star. And uh, the other is the technique that I use. So down at the bottom here, this is the Atacama large millimeter submillimeter array in Northern Chile, which I'll talk about more during my talk. And um, feel free to interrupt with questions if you have them during the talk, I don't mind. Um, I turned it on so I it makes a chime when somebody raises a hand. I don't know if I'll see the chat, but uh, I'll do my best to keep an eye on it. So, um, and the other thing I was gonna say is after looking at those amazingly gorgeous um, astrophotography efforts from everybody in your club, uh, I am I have to apologize in advance because I work on the edge of signal to noise with radio telescopes. So we are not gonna have nearly as beautiful images as you guys are making um, from your telescopes. Those are really impressive and gorgeous. Um, but I will show you some cool science. So, just to give you an overview of my talk, I'm going to give you a bit of background, general background about planet formation, just to make sure everybody's on the same page about like why we're doing this stuff and why we care about it and what some of the big questions are. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about radio astronomy and interferometry, um, and then I'll tell you about some cool stuff that my group is working on. So the motivating questions here are big questions, right? Ultimately, we want to try to answer some of the big questions in astronomy about how do planets form? Where where did where did we come from, right? What types of planets are most common? How weird is the Earth? Um, how normal is our solar system? And then how common is life in the universe? If we can understand what types of planets form and how common they are around other stars, ultimately we're trying to get at big questions about life in the universe. So um, that's what motivates the research that I do. And uh, you all know that you can see evidence of planet formation all around you, and you can see clues to how planets form around other stars. You don't need a fancy telescope to do it. This is um, an image just of, of a single beautiful night sky where you have a bunch of different solar system objects, Saturn, the moon, Venus, and Jupiter. And um, you see they're all in a line, right? They're not scattered all over the sky. Uh, they're all in a plane for the most part. They travel along the ecliptic. And that's not a coincidence. That's our first clue to how our solar system formed. So uh, if you watch these planets from night to night, from month to month, from year to year, you see them um, moving around the sky relative to the background stars. And you notice something interesting, which is that um, 
not only are they all in the same plane, but they're all moving around the sky in the same direction, counterclockwise if you were looking from way above the North Pole of the Earth down at the solar system. Everything is moving counterclockwise around the sun, and almost every all of the planets are rotating on their axis counterclockwise as well. Then you get a small telescope or a big telescope and you see things like this. And I love this video. This is a, a sh double shadow transit um, of the planet Jupiter. So we've got a moon here and a moon here and they're casting their shadows on the planet. But the thing that I want you to notice is that the planet is spinning, right? Jupiter has the, the shortest rotation period of any planet in our solar system. And the moons are orbiting the same direction that the planet is spinning. And this is more evidence of that same preferred counterclockwise orbital direction that we see in the entire solar system. And then we can go even further and look at all of the asteroids, including both main belt and near Earth asteroids. Uh, this is an animation that I really love to show. So the blue is the near Earth asteroids and the orange is the main belt asteroids. It'll start in a moment. It has a really slow start for some reason. So um, this is also showing the progress of how much we've learned about asteroids over the last kind of 10 years. It starts in 1999 and ends in 2018. So if you watch, you can see that they're all swirling around in that same counterclockwise direction. There are a few exceptions here and there, but um, for the most part, you can get hypnotized by this animation and just see this river of asteroids all following that same preferred counterclockwise orbital direction. Um, that we see in the orbits of the planets, in the rotation of the planets, in most of the moons of the planets that we know of. So uh, now let's let's take what we can see from with our naked eye and with small telescopes, and now we can move out to look at Orion because Orion is special in being the closest stellar nursery to the Earth. So this is what it looks like if you look with your eye through like an eight inch telescope, right? Um, this is what it looks like with the Hubble Space Telescope. And what we're seeing here is dust, similar to a lot of those astrophotos that we were just looking at of different star forming regions. And the dust in this image um, is teeny, teeny, tiny, but this is the basic building block of planets. So in order to build a planet, what do you have to do? You have to take the dust in these star forming regions and you have to stick it together and stick it together and stick it together. We think we go from the bottom up. Uh, to form these, uh, to form the planets in our solar system. And so when we look at the Orion Nebula, what we see is we're looking at um, dust that's like the size of particles and cigarette smoke, so submicron size dust. And you can see it sort of wreathing around in these smoke-like motions in the Orion Nebula. And um, those on large scales, those kind of slow wreathing motions uh, are pretty subtle, right? But then as you start to collapse under the influence of gravity, which we think is the first stage in planet formation, um, stuff starts to stick, it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then uh, if you know, if you remember from like physics classes, right, conservation of angular momentum, just like a figure skater who pulls in their arms and spins faster and faster and faster, the same thing happens, except you're, you're getting smaller over about 13 orders of magnitude. So you spin really, really, really fast. And we wind up with a situation where we have something sticky and then it's spinning faster and faster and faster. And I want you to all think about the other times in your life when you've encountered sticky things that spin and what happens. So here's a little animation to help you out. Um, hopefully you can see that. So uh, when we have sticky pizza dough and then we spin it, what happens? It flattens into a disk. And that's exactly what happens to the planet forming material in the Orion Nebula as gravity is sticking things together. And then the spin is going to flatten them out and give them that preferred plane and that preferred rotation direction. And that's what accounts for those observations that we were talking about in the solar system. And so when we zoom in on the Orion Nebula with the Hubble Space Telescope, what we see are these little knots that are called proplids for protoplanetary disk. And um, when we zoom in on those, they look kind of like this. And so what we're seeing here are baby stars, which are the colorful things in the middle here. Then we've got the background nebula, which are the colors in the background. And these black smudges are the silhouettes of pizza-shaped disks of gas and dust where planets are actively forming. So that's what we're seeing here is we're seeing those pizzas. Look, we're seeing them at different angles. So some of them look more circular, like this one looks kind of circular because we're seeing it sort of face on. And this one is more tilted, so it looks more elliptical. But we're seeing those pizzas at different angles in silhouette against the background nebula. 
Now, um, the reason it looks like this at optical wavelengths is because this dust is very cold um, in these protoplanetary disks. When you get really close to the star, it can get warm, like 1,000 Kelvin or so, up to 2,000 Kelvin. But then out in the outskirts, we're talking about tens of Kelvin in terms of the temperatures that we're seeing. So uh, it's not going to shine at optical wavelengths. It's very dark and cold. It's very th dense and thick. So that's why we can't see through it, why we just see the silhouette against the background nebula. But if you look at radio light, which is, um, wh which is where even cold things glow with thermal emission, then you can really start to see some detail in these. And I'm going to talk more about this image later on, but this is one of the most spectacular um, discoveries of the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array is that when you really zoom in on the structure in these disks, you see a ton of rings and gaps, and that's exactly what we expected if planet formation is actively happening in these disks. So in these nearby star forming regions, we're seeing not only um, evidence of how our solar system formed, where it formed out of a single cloud of gas and dust flattened into a disk, but we're also seeing the rings and gaps that indicate active planet formation is happening during this stage. Um, so just to kind of give you the, the like overview of the star and planet formation process, um, to kind of recap what I've been talking about, we start off with these giant molecular clouds like the Orion Nebula, like the Cone Nebula, like some of these other nebulae that you were looking at with your astrophotography. The densest parts of those clouds collapse under the influence of gravity. Then we wind up with what's called a protostar, which is very embedded in um, sort of a pseudo disk and an envelope. There are outflows. It's very messy. And then all of that settles down into what we would call um, a pre-main sequence star surrounded by a protoplanetary disk. That's what we're seeing in the Orion Nebula. And then eventually that primordial gas and dust that's left over from the formation of the star dissipates and we're left with something that looks like our solar system, a main sequence star, possibly surrounded by a disk, possibly including planets. And so my research and what I'll talk about for the rest of the talk really focuses on these last two stages, the stage where we're assembling planets in the protoplanetary disk, and then the stage where the solar system is evolving into its final configuration. Um, and we have analogs of the Kuiper belt in our own solar system system that we can look at with radio telescopes. And uh, I've already shown you some real images from the Hubble Space Telescope of pre-main sequence stars. I wanted to show you one of my favorite images of a debris disk. It's a little closer to home. Here it is. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been able, have been fortunate enough to see with your eyes the zodiacal light, right? So this is not the Milky Way here. This is something called the zodiacal light, which is dust that's generated by collisions of asteroids and Jupiter family comets in the inner solar system. And we are sitting in the middle of it. So it looks very bright to us. Um, and I mean, not very bright, but you can see it if you're in a dark sky location. I've seen it from Mauna Kea before. It's it's really cool. You're like, wait, that's the Milky Way. And what's this other thing? Uh, that's the zodiacal light. So um, we're sitting inside one debris disk in our solar system. But if we were alien astronomers who were looking back at the sun with our telescopes, um, there are two things to note. One is that we uh, th the zodiacal light would not actually be the brighter debris disk in our solar system. The Kuiper belt would be the brighter debris disk because it's bigger and there's more dust. Um, even though it's colder and farther away from the star, that would actually be the brighter disk. The reason that we see the zodiacal light with our eyes from the Earth is just because we're sitting inside it. So that's why it's brighter to us. But for an external observer, the Kuiper belt would be the brightest debris disk in our solar system. And then the second thing to note is that if we were the alien astronomers looking back at the sun, what we would actually see is nothing. And that's because our current technology is actually not sensitive enough to detect a Kuiper belt analog around another star. So when we talk about debris disks later on, all of the debris disks that I will show you are scaled up analogs of our solar system's Kuiper belt. They're actually significantly more massive by at least an order of magnitude uh, than our solar system's Kuiper belt. So, and we see them around like 25 to 30% of nearby stars. So the tip of the iceberg is the stuff that's more than 10 times brighter than the Kuiper belt. And so that basically tells us that every star has a debris disk at some level, probably. Just like every star pretty much has planets. Um, so this is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. It's the telescope that I use to do all of my research. It's a set of 66 antennas located in northern Chile. Each antenna in the main array, here's a person for scale, each of these antennas is 12 meters in diameter. Um, and so it's 
basically the size of a small house. And they, the amazing thing about this array is um, these antennas are not fixed in location. They have uh, two special transport machines where they can come and pick up this house sized object and drive it around on the Altiplano, the flat, flat plain in Northern Chile where the array is located. And um, so the array can have lots of different configurations. It can, they can all be kind of bunched together to give you broad views of the sky or they can be spread out to give you really high angular resolution views of the sky. And it's a really special place. Um, I got to go there while the array was under construction. And uh, it's amazing because when you look at this image, you can see it looks like it's just kind of flat ground. Um, and uh, it is, but it's about 16,500 feet above sea level, which is taller than Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So it's this huge, um, bigger than 15 kilometers, because that's the longest baseline that Alma goes out to, huge, like 15 kilometer um, high plain up uh, 16,500 feet above sea level. So that's great at millimeter wavelengths because it gets you above most of the Earth's atmosphere, um, which is mostly good because water vapor is what really blocks the light at these frequencies. So you want to get above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And the other thing that's great about it is it's the second driest desert on Earth. And I don't know if you know what the driest desert on Earth is. It's um, it's actually Antarctica, which surprises a lot of people because you think of Antarctica and you think snow and ice and water. Um, but it almost never snows in Antarctica. It's just cold, so the snow never melts. Um, so Antarctica is the driest desert on Earth. There are actually a lot of radio telescopes there too. Uh, and this is the second driest desert on Earth. So it's almost perfect um, if you really want to get high up above, see, uh, high up above most of the atmosphere, most of the water vapor in the atmosphere, and then be able to spread your antennas out as far as possible to get those really sharp, high resolution views of the universe. And when I went there, it's just an amazing place. This is a picture that I took when I went to um, visit Alma in northern Chile. There are volcanoes all around the horizon, and you can see like little trails of ash. They're very active volcanoes. And these are salt flats with flamingos flying around in them. I don't know if you knew that there were flamingos high in the desert in northern Chile, but there are. There are these flocks of, it's very eerie and um, beautiful. Anyway. Um, so the technique is called interferometry, and the technique of interferometry involves taking many little telescopes and letting them act like one big telescope. So uh, this image here is just to remind you of the general concept of angular resolution, which I know many of you are very familiar with, but just to bring along the those of you who, are, who might be new to these concepts. Um, this is, I kind of like this image because it's uh, it's sort of an imagination about making things better than the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope is not actually that big a telescope. It's a two meter telescope. That's pretty good, but it's not actually that much bigger than telescopes that we have in Connecticut, for example. The only reason it's so good is because it's up in space and the atmosphere doesn't blur out images. Um, but so if you look at something that looks blurry with the Hubble Space Telescope and you want to get better resolution so you can see lots of detail, you have to make your telescope bigger. So this is a concept for an 11 meter space telescope. And they're showing how some a galaxy that's really far away that looks kind of blurry with the Hubble Space Telescope comes into definition when you increase the size of your telescope. So in general, bigger telescopes let you see more details than smaller telescopes. Now, the problem is that at radio wavelengths, because the wavelength of light is so long, um, a two meter, even an 11 meter telescope won't show you any details at all. The beam sizes on those telescopes, the resolution on those telescopes is like degrees in size. So if you want to see detail at radio wavelengths, you have to make telescopes that are um, tens of kilometers in diameter. So that's just not feasible, right? You can't make a 15 kilometer diameter single aperture telescope the way you can for you know a two meter and 11 meter optical telescope. So what do you do instead? Um, so if you wanted to make a 15 kilometer aperture, which you can't, instead you scatter a bunch of antennas across that 15 kilometer aperture. And effectively what that does is it's like having um, an aperture where you only have a few windows. It's like if you took your, um, your single aperture telescope and you made a mask for the front of the telescope where you only let in light here and here and here and here and here and here. And maybe some of you have done this if you've tried to make um, do astrophotography of like the moon or something, right, where you have to stop down your aperture. You don't want to lose resolution, but you do want to take out some of the aperture so you don't get as much sensitivity to really bright objects like the moon. So actually, that's what an interferometer does. It's um, instead of stopping down your aperture, you're sort of just scattering these antennas around and getting little bits 
of a bigger aperture. And then the trick is combining the signal in both hardware and software after you've taken those observations. Um, and you can do that because radio, the, um, the heterodyne receivers that we use for radio telescopes are not photon detectors the way CCDs are, right? A, a CCD is a photon counter. A heterodyne receiver is actually a wave detector. So you're getting the entire electromagnetic wave and you're able to take both the amplitude and the phase information and combine it um, in, uh, in uh, both hardware and software. So you can measure the entire wave, you can combine it in software. And so um, one of the world's largest supercomputers is the correlator that sits at the ALMA site at 16,500 feet above sea level. And it's just correlating these signals over and over and over again, because it's not only every pair of antennas, it's every single channel in each of those pairs of antennas um, and uh, and then other things too, like there are a couple different polarizations and stuff. So you need a massive supercomputer to process these signals. So really the process of getting ALMA online is the process of seeing the universe with new glasses. And um, I got my first pair of glasses when I was 15 years old. And one of the things that I remember is that before this is kind of what trees look like to me, or I don't know, they were like big blurry things. And then afterwards, I was completely fascinated by the intricacies of the tree branches. And so I have all these pictures that I took when I was a 15 year old of just tree branches, because I was like, wow, look at that. That's amazing. Because I hadn't seen it <laughs> before. Um, and so it's that's the experience. That's the same experience that I've had as an astronomer working with uh, the precursor facilities to ALMA and then getting to work with ALMA as it came online about uh, almost 11 years ago. Well, we just had the 10 years of ALMA conference in December. And so it's been about 10 years. Uh, ALMA came online right when I started my postdoctoral research, basically. So I've gotten to experience over the course of my scientific career, these new glasses that have allowed us to see things in the universe that we couldn't have imagined before. So just to show you an example of this, I've already given away the punchline, but this is um, shortly before ALMA came online. These data were taken with a facility called Karma, which is the millimeter interferometer that I used for my postdoctoral work. And this is HL Tau. It's one of the um, it's one of the protoplanetary disks in the Taurus uh, Auriga star forming region. So this is what it looked like beforehand. And so everybody thought, hey, here's a nice big bright disk that we can use to do some commissioning work with ALMA. And so this is the disk that they use to test the long baseline configuration with ALMA. And so the same disk with this brand new telescope gave us this image, which has now, I mean, now you see it in like astronomy textbooks. I mean, this is this is literally a, now a textbook image of planet formation. And it was only made possible because of those long baselines with ALMA. We didn't know what we would see. People People had imagined for years that there might be rings and gaps, but nobody really expected this level of rings and gaps. And the other big surprise is that this system is only 1 million years old. And theorists had told us, you can't even start to form Jupiter-sized planets until 10 million years after the star is born. We won't see anything at 1 million year old. And yet here it is, right? Planet formation is robust, it's fast, and we have to figure out how it can happen so fast. So that's been a challenge for the theorists as well. So I wanted to kind of walk you through some of Alma's greatest hits over the past 10 years, because there's a lot. Um, so here's a baby solar system at 1 AU resolution. So this is the scale of the Earth's orbit around the sun. This is the highest resolution image of a planet forming system that has ever been taken before. I'm a co-author on this paper as well. So um, this was after HL Tau, we were like, how good can we do? And basically how good you can do is you can look at the closest disk with the longest baselines that Alma has. And here's what we saw. The amazing thing is we saw um, lots of rings and gaps, just like in the HL Tau system, but we even see this gap that's right at the resolution limit of the telescope. So that's telling us that there's a planet forming at one astronomical unit from this star. So we're basically watching um, a an Earth scale planet forming system uh, in this in this disk around a nearby young star, which is amazing. Um, when you go out and ask the question, how many of these protoplanetary disks have structure like gaps and rings? The answer is all of them. So this is another, uh, this is one of the ALMA large programs that I was involved with as well. I'm a co-author on this paper as well. 
where uh, we went out and looked at a set of 20 of these protoplanetary disks. And we just see structure everywhere, gaps, rings, spiral arms. Um, those are kind of interesting because that's telling us something different about planet formation. Probably it has to do with the masses of some of these disks being large enough that we can actually um, create some gravitational instability and we might have some planets forming um, directly from collapse rather than building up from little pieces from the ground up. Um, so that's pretty cool. And uh, so then if we think about, um, let's let's go back and talk about one more concept in planet formation. So what I want you to imagine now is that you're an alien on a tour of the solar system. You've never been here before. You just want to come check it out. And uh, okay, there's the sun. It's hot. We're not going to visit there. So the first place you visit is Mercury, little rocky dirt ball. Kind of uncomfortable there. So you go to the next one. Oh, there's another little rocky dirt ball. But ooh, it's also pretty hot on the surface. And there's acid bearing clouds. And it's ooh, not a great place to visit. Oh, here's another rocky dirt ball. Earth. Oh, it's got little things crawling all over it. Maybe I'll keep going. Okay, next comes Mars. And at this point, you're like, all right, I've got the hang of the solar system. It's little rocky dirt balls. Check. I've visited the solar system until you get past the asteroid belt. And then, oh my gosh, there's Jupiter, right? All of a sudden, we have completely different composition, completely different size planet. And we get this division between the little rocky dirt balls in the inner solar system and the big gas and ice giants in the outer solar system. So something happens here in between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. And maybe you guys know the answer to this already. What is it? What is it? Right. This is where um, we get something called the snow or frost or ice line. So inside this line, it's hot. Outside this line, it's cold enough to get the hydrogen bearing compounds. And remember, hydrogen is the most abundant atom in the universe. So if you can take hydrogen bearing compounds and freeze them out into solid form, like water, ice, methane, ammonia, all of a sudden you're gonna have a lot more solids and that's what we need to build up the cores of these giant planets. So inside this line, those things are in gas form. They're not available to form planets. Outside this line, you get all the hydrogen bearing compounds in solid form. They're available to form the big cores of the planets. And that's how you get the big gas and ice giants. So the snow or frost or ice line is extremely important in planet formation theory. And we want to know, where is it in other solar systems? Is our understanding of it correct? So we want to be able to figure out where the snow or frost or ice line is. And so one of the amazing things that Alma has done is that we can actually see evidence directly of this of the snow line for um, the second most abundant molecule in the universe, carbon monoxide. The most abundant molecule in the universe is molecular hydrogen, but it's basically invisible for random physics-y reasons. It doesn't have a dipole moment, so it's very hard to observe. But CO, which is the second most abundant molecule, is uh, easy to observe with a telescope like ALMA. So what we're looking at here is actually not CO. We're looking at um, a molecule called uh, N2H+. And um, so this molecule, N2H+, is uh, destroyed by carbon monoxide in its gas form. So anywhere you have carbon monoxide in its gas form, you don't have N2H+. And that's what we're seeing in the inner part of the solar system where it's hot. So that's this is where the carbon monoxide has been liberated. It's in its gas form and it destroys N2H+. So that's why we see a hole in the middle here. And then outside that line, once the CO in its gas form freezes out into solid state on the dust grains, um, then the N2H plus has a party. Woo! And so that's what we're seeing here. Lots of N2H plus where the CO is frozen out into ice form. So, um, so this distance right here is the location of the CO snow line. Um, that we can detect with ALMA. So this has provided really important constraints on our models of where and how and what types of planets are forming in these systems. And also we've got complex organic molecules. So if you care about life, you might care about complex organic molecules. And we can see that these building blocks of life are already present even in these early like one to 10 million year old protoplanetary disks. So that's what the spectra over here is showing you is different complex organic molecules. Another important factor in forming planets is turbulence. So turbulence, not just for airplanes anymore. Um, turbulence is really important for getting solids to stick together, actually. And you might think, doesn't it shake things up? And the answer is, yeah, if there's too much turbulence, it's going to shake things up. But actually, if there's a little bit of turbulence, it can help the process of planet formation by creating regions of slightly higher and lower pressure. And um, solids like to aggregate at pressure maxima. So one of the real problems in forming planets is how do you get 
So like it's easy to get tiny stuff to stick together. That's like making a sand castle at the beach. Those little sand grains like to stick together. But if you start taking two sand castles and throwing them at each other, you're just going to get a mess, right? So it's actually really hard to get beyond the meter size in planet formation. There's something called the meter size barrier where you get a lot of fragmentation and you can't it's hard to form things by sticking them together bigger than a meter. So what turbulence does for you is um, just like if you've ever paddled a canoe down a stream and you see these little vortices where you can collect twigs and leaves and rocks, um, turbulent vortices or uh, regions of high pressure and turbulent disks can collect a whole bunch of solids together. And then all of a sudden you might have enough that gravity can take over and start holding them together. So this is basically how we think you get past the meter size barrier is by having a little bit of turbulence. So a lot of the work that I did um, like about five-ish years ago with my postdoc, Kevin Flaherty, who is now um, a an astronomer at Williams College, is uh, we made a lot of the first measurements of how much turbulence is in these disks. So what you're seeing here, so another cool thing that Alma can do is it doesn't only take pictures of dust, it also takes pictures of these small molecules. And the amazing thing about interferometry, it's almost magical, is that with interferometry, you don't only get a spectrum, right? You're probably familiar with the idea of a spectrum that you're seeing how much emission there is at different frequencies or velocities across a molecule. Um, so with an interferometer, not only do you get how much flux you have as a function of velocity, you actually get a picture at each different velocity across the line. And I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody's interested, but you can just take my word for it. And so what you're seeing here is um, this butterfly pattern as you go from a high velocity to kind of a medium velocity to a really low velocity. These are like red shifts and blue shifts where um, some of the material is moving towards you and some is moving away from you. So you're seeing the rotation of the disk as it orbits around the star. And then there's a lot of information in the details of the structure here. Again, I'm not going to get into the details. Feel free to ask me about it. I'll show you yeah. one whole thing. May, about I, may I ask a question? Yeah, please. So I'm a physician and what I'm looking at here reminds me of when you take a uh, an MRI and move it in three dimensions, the slices and, and stack it in a in an application. And yeah. that would describe a three-dimensional object as, I mean, let me ask, does this describe a three-dimensional phenomenon versus a two-dimensional phenomenon? Yes, there are so many overlaps between astronomical imaging and medical imaging um, that there are entire institutes devoted to combining techniques for astronomical imaging and medical imaging. And actually, one of my former students, um, after going to Wesleyan and studying stuff very similar to this, uh, he went on to a career in data science where he was working on imaging blood flow through the heart in real time. And then he was working on software to detect cancerous lung nodules. And now he works on some kind of dental software to detect cavities in an automated way, because it is exactly the same process of trying to reconstruct a three-dimensional object from a, two, a, slice, a set of slices of two-dimensional images. It's exactly the same techniques and tools that we use to do the image analysis for astronomy and medical imaging. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so we get, um, by analyzing the detailed structure of these things, we can actually measure how much turbulence there is and how it changes with location in the disk. And that also tells us about the efficiency of planet formation, how easy it is and what types of planets can form. So here's the cool thing that I wanted to mention, which is that when we see something we don't expect in these images, sometimes it can be a direct indication that you've formed a planet there. And so one of the cool things that Alma has been able to do is um, this is showing you one single slice uh, from the previous image. And what you can see is, so the, the white line here is what we expect basically from a Keplerian disk model. And you can see that one side of the disk just follows that white line very nicely. But the other side of the disk has something that people have been calling a kink or um, like a Doppler flip, some people call it, where uh, it doesn't quite follow the white line. One part goes a little bit inside the white line and then it flips to be outside the white line and then it kind of keeps going towards the white line. And this is actually showing you a region in the disk where you get something that's a little bit faster than Keplerian rotation. So that would be like a little bit red shifted moving away from you. And then something that's a little bit slower than Keplerian rotation, so blue shifted and moving towards you. And that's actually a mini disk around a planet that you're seeing in there. Um, so this is a, an, a disk or an envelope of a planet that's embedded inside the disk. So this is a new way to detect planets uh, by looking at 
how the Keplerian, how the the gas motions deviate slightly from Kepler's laws inside these disks. So that's pretty cool too. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so that's those are that's sort of a list of Alma's greatest hits in planet formation. Um, and now I thought I would just switch it for the last uh, little bit into um, what my group is working on. But I guess I can also pause here and just see if anybody has any other questions before I do that. Um, or I can just keep going and then you can ask questions at the end. So I have one quick question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned radio telescopes or sort of wave detectors versus photon detectors. What was that called again? Start with an H. Yeah, it's a heterodyne receiver. So that's just okay. the type of detector that we use. We can actually do photon detector. Well, so basically at radio wavelengths, the two types of detectors that we use most commonly are heterodyne receivers, which are wave detectors. And then we use something called a bolometer, which is actually like a temperature measurement measuring machine. So um, a bolometer measures across the electromagnetic spectrum, the total energy flux, and it raises the temperature of the detector. And then you kind of read it out. So um the bolometers are, I mean, I love bolometers. The The story is kind of cool that um, they were invented by this guy, Samuel Pierpont Langley in like the 1860s or 80s, I want to say. And uh, he did this demonstration. You can ask the Smithsonian Air and Space guy if he knows about this. Um, he did this demonstration. He, he I think, was uh, involved with Smithsonian Institute in some way. And he did a demonstration in Washington, D.C., where he detected the thermal emission from a cow at a distance of, I think, 100 meters or so. And so you can use that same technique um, to detect thermal emission from uh, baby planets in distant solar systems, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, I can see something in the chat, too. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's just if anyone has questions, feel free to put. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So um, here's some cool stuff my group is working on. Oh, wait, what's in the chat now? Wah! Um, oh, Mateo. Hi, Mateo. Um, Mateo is a student at Wesleyan. <laughs> Earlier in the talk, you mentioned that if aliens observed our solar system, they would see the Kuiper Belt as the brightest part in the radio wavelength. But looking at what Alma has observed, it appears like the opposite is true. Oh, um, does this have to do with the ages of the star? So, uh, so... I think maybe um, I want to make sure I understand what Mateo is asking here, but I think the uh, the the confusion here might be the Kuiper belt is brighter than the asteroid belt if we were observing from a distant solar system. Um, and that would be true for basically any planetary system that we've seen. With some exceptions, there are some systems where we think we have giant impacts, um, where actually the inner part is the brightest. But for most of these systems, the Kuiper belt is brighter than the asteroid belt. Uh, the difference here is that I'm talking about different stages in evolution. Um, and so protoplanetary disks, which are the young ones, are much brighter than debris disks, which are the old ones. So I'm going to get more into debris disks now. Um, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so what are debris disks and why should you care? So here's a little um, graph that tells us a little bit about planet formation again. Uh, so if you think about age, right, um, protoplanetary disks like HL Tau, which I'm showing here, are generally, as I mentioned, they're about 1 to 10 million years old. And most of the exoplanets that we look at are around billion-year-old main sequence stars or like multi-billion-year-old main sequence stars. Um, and so a lot can happen in between when you're first forming the planets at this stage and when you're seeing exoplanetary systems at this stage. Similarly, in terms of grain size, the dust that we're looking at here is sort of micron to centimeters in size. And then we're talking about planets that are over 100 kilometers in size. So debris disks um, have, have an important role to play in filling the age gap between when planets form and then as the planetary system evolves over that first billion years, mostly it's actually during the debris disk stage that the planetary orbits are evolving and the architecture is settling into kind of the final configuration that we're probing with these exoplanetary systems. So the holy grail of planet formation is to be able to go from the initial conditions in the protoplanetary disks to exoplanets. And debris disks are a really important part of that process because that's what's probing the intermediate stage between the protoplanetary disks and the exoplanets that we're seeing around other stars. So debris disks are really important for understanding planet formation and how it evolves from 10 million years through to billion year exoplanetary systems. So that's what my group is mostly working on these days. Um, 
This is a project, I'll just go through a couple of projects and then I'll tell you what we're doing right now. So this is a project to look at um, the prevalence of Uranus and Neptune analogs around other stars. And the idea is actually really simple. The idea is that if you can look at how puffy a disk is, that's a probe of the total mass that's hidden in the disk. So if you have Uranus and Neptune analogs, anytime a dust grain comes near it, that dust grain is going to get kicked around by the gravity of this big planet that's hidden in the disk. And so the disk will get puffy. Um, whereas if you only have like a little swarm of Plutos, then each of those Plutos is not going to kick the dust grains very much and the disk will be very flat. So we're looking at how um, flat or puffy these debris disks are as a way of probing the total mass and understanding whether we have Uranus or Neptune analogs. So this was a set of observations um, that my student Kale Daly worked on. Uh, and showing that there um, are no Uranus and Neptune analogs in this particular debris disk system, AUMIC. And uh, and so here's a model that includes only 1.6 Earth masses of total uh, planet mass hidden in the disk. And you can see that it fits the data very well. We don't have any residuals left. It just looks like noise after we subtract the model. So that's great. And then my other student, David Visgon, came along a few years later and uh, looked at, so these were all my observations at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. And for various physics reasons that I won't get into tonight, the wavelength is roughly equal to the dust grain size. And unlike at optical wavelengths, which you guys are used to, right, where you only have this very narrow slice of the electromagnetic spectrum to work with, what we call the radio window is many orders of magnitude in wavelength wide, right? Well, you, I mean, if you think about it, in optical, you've got like at most a factor of two in wavelength. And in radio, you've got like three or four orders of magnitude of different wavelengths to work with. So here we change the wavelength by a factor of three, which also changes the grain size by a factor of three. And if you just look at this with your eyes, right, you can kind of ask yourself, well, wait, are these the same puffiness or does one look puffier than the other? And I don't know. I think this one looks flatter and this one looks puffier. And then you do some modeling and you're like, hey, that's actually true. We can show that very rigorously with a bunch of fancy statistics that in fact, this um, at this wavelength, the disk is puffier than at this wavelength. And that's really interesting because it's telling us something completely unexpected about the dust in this disk. Um, it's telling us the opposite of what theorists had predicted based on collisional cascade physics, which is when you get big stuff and you grind it down into little stuff, um, you actually expect that the smaller grains are going to be puffed up more than the larger grains. And what we see is the opposite. And we're still trying to figure out why that's the case, actually. We don't really know. Um, but uh, I'll, as I'll talk about at the end, we're actually going to do this for a larger sample of objects and see, is this one just an oddball? Because AUMIC is actually a very weird system for a number of reasons. AU microscopy is an M dwarf. There are almost no visible debris disks around M dwarfs. This is the biggest and brightest one. Um, it has a lot of flaring activity. The star goes through big flares. It has a really strong stellar wind. So maybe something weird is happening with the collisional cascade. Maybe it's not actually a steady state collisional cascade. So we're trying to figure that out now. Um, but the, the cool thing is that this was our first observation of a debris disk at a high enough resolution to probe the mass. And now we're working on a much larger sample, as I'll show you soon. So we're also interested in, I told you a lot about gaps and rings in protoplanetary disks, and we don't know whether there are also gaps and rings in debris disks. So here's an example. Um, over the past kind of five to 10 years with Alma, we've been uh, trying to look at these disks at higher resolution. The problem is that debris disks are one to three orders of magnitude fainter than protoplanetary disks. So this is really technically very difficult to do. It takes a lot of observing time to observe even one system. So here's one that we were looking at, HD206893. This one's interesting because um, this is an image uh, in the optical where the star has been blocked out. And there's actually a little brown dwarf companion here that fits right inside this disk. And we were not actually looking for gaps when we made this observation. We were actually trying to figure out how massive this companion is to figure out if it was a planet or a brown dwarf. So we were like, OK, we're, how far out does it carve out the disk? And what we found is that we couldn't actually get a good model um, just by including a single uh, a single smooth disk, what we had to do is we had to take out a gap and that made our residuals go away. And that was part of a trend. This is my student, Ava Niederlander, who figured this out in 2021. And that was part of a trend of finding gaps and rings in a few of the brightest debris disk systems. But we don't really have a sense yet of how common these are. And so... Um, 
the future, or what my group is really working on right now, is this is a new large program with the ALMA telescope. So over the past year, we've had about 200 hours of time with ALMA uh, to just stare at these debris disks and try to get high angular resolutions observations of a big sample of debris disks. So remember before I showed you the D-sharp survey, which is that sample of 20 different protoplanetary disks with ALMA, where we saw the gaps and rings and all of these different systems. Now we're trying to do that with the more evolved debris disk cousins, um, which is a lot harder because they're a lot fainter. But we're, we're um, doing this for a, a sample of 18 different debris disks, and we're going to look at their radial structure, figure out how common rings and gaps are, their vertical structure to figure out how common those Uranus and Neptune analogs are, and then our gas structure. So the three big questions that we're trying to answer right now are, first, do debris disks inherit that ringed and gap structure from protoplanetary disks? Right now, we don't really know because we only have low-resolution observations of um, debris disks or like prior to arcs, we didn't know. So uh, this is a histogram that's showing you um, the fractional width, so how wide these debris disks are compared to how far away they are from their star. Um, and so these would be like a narrow ring and these would be a wide belt. And you can compare that for debris disks, which are the blue, and protoplanetary disks from D sharp, which would be the orange. So based on what we know from low resolution, it looks like we actually don't inherit the structure of protoplanetary disks. There's some evolution happening between the protoplanetary and the debris disk stage, but we don't know prior to arcs, are these actually wide belts or are they just unresolved gaps and rings because we didn't have the, the detail to be able to see the gaps and rings. So this is one of the reasons that we need to do this high resolution survey with ALMA is to figure out, okay, do the, do the Kuiper belts um, do the Kuiper belt analogs inherit their structure from protoplanetary disks, or are we actually looking at fundamentally different structures at 10 million years versus 100 million years? The second question, and these are all of my students at Wesleyan who are working with me, I'm, I'm leading team three, which is the vertical structure team uh, for ARCs. This, uh, the second question is how common are Uranus and Neptune analogs and how common are Neptune-like migration histories? And so another cool trick that you can play with these um, puffiness measurements, the vertical structure measurements, is not only can you just ask the question of how puffy are they, but you can also ask the question of does a single Gaussian distribution describe the vertical structure of these disks well or does it not? Because in our own solar system, we have what's called a cold classical belt that's thin. And then we have the scattered belt, which is thick. And the scattered belt comes from Neptune's migration through the Kuiper belt early on in the history of the solar system. And there's um, there are only two disks. I showed you one, AU MIC, already. The other one is Beta PIC, where previously observations had been done at high enough resolution to ask this question. AU MIC was well described by a single Gaussian, but Beta PIC is not. So with Beta PIC, you need that double scale structure, the narrow Gaussian and the wide Gaussian, to reproduce what you're seeing in the vertical domain. So this is the vertical distance from the midplane, and this is showing you the red line is just a single Gaussian, and it doesn't look very good compared to the data. But if you add two scales, a wide Gaussian plus a narrow Gaussian, you get the green line, which is a much better fit to the data. And so that's evidence that in the Beta Pictoris system, there was probably some Neptune-like migration history, and we want to know how common that is. So um, how common are Uranus and Neptune analogs, and how common are Neptune-like migration histories is something that all of these wonderful students who you see, and uh, the postdoc, Brianna Zawadzki, that you see on the screen here are working on with me right now. And then the, the third and final question is, how is the gas distributed and do we have these kinematic signatures of planets and debris disks? So when I showed you this kinematic signature of planets before, this was for a protoplanetary disk. And so we've there have been discoveries of a handful of these in protoplanetary disks, but nobody's really looked for them in debris disks before. So we're going to do the same type of analysis on the debris disk gas to ask, are we seeing evidence of planets and do those planets have similar orbital properties and mass properties to the ones that we're seeing in protoplanetary disks? And here's just our preliminary gallery. Uh, this is what the observations look like so far. And these are the highest resolution radio images of Kuiper Belt analogs that have ever been taken. Um, and we're busily working on analyzing them right now to try to get answers to all of these questions. So with that, I'll just summarize. Debris disks have gaps, probably carved by planets. There are no Neptunes in AU MIC. Maybe it's not a steady state collisional cascade. We're trying to figure out what's going on there. But we're now we're doing this high resolution study of a bunch of different targets to learn about things like 
um, how the solar system evolves between the protoplanetary and the debris disk stage, how common Uranus and Neptune analogs are, how common Neptune-like migration histories are, and then are there planets that we can detect through kinematic signatures of molecular gas observations in these debris disks, and do they have similar properties to planets that we see at earlier stages of planetary system evolution? So I'll stop there and take any other questions that you guys have. And um, thanks again for joining me to talk about it tonight. I have a question. Does this cover both uh, rocky planets and gas planets? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the answer is that most of these Kuiper Belt scales in the planetary systems are similar to Kuiper Belt scales in our own solar system. So we're, we're thinking probably most of these planets would be sort of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune analogs, just because that's the radial scale in the planetary system. Like, remember, I talked earlier about that snow or frost or ice line. Most of these debris belts exist outside the snow or frost or ice line. So we're thinking they probably coincide with more Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune type planets. But I also showed you that system where we were actually able to get one out astronomical unit resolution, the TW Hydra system. And then with debris disks, because many of them are just at closer distances to the sun, we can actually get very good kind of AU scale resolution in those systems as well. In fact, uh, the um, the AU mix system that I showed you, I think that was like a two AU resolution image. So we can actually look at these systems on the scale of terrestrial planet forming regions as well. It's just that there's not as much dust there because most of the dust is generated by the Kuiper belt. So we're mostly learning about giant planets with the debris disk observations at this point. But we also know of a few systems where it does have a double belt structure similar to the solar system where we can see visually both an asteroid belt and a debris belt. And so that's, that's very exciting also. That's actually something where the James Webb Space Telescope is starting to contribute. Um, for example, in the FOMOHOT system, uh, James Webb is actually sensitive enough to see that asteroid belt analog in addition to the Kuiper belt analog, which is really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Do planets necessarily form only around pre-main sequence star? Would it be possible for a mature star to capture new dust that could form into new planets? That's a great question. Um, so uh, one thing that's been really neat in the debris disk field is there's a whole subfield of people studying uh, white dwarfs. And um, we know that there are planets around white dwarfs, that there are debris disks, including gas and dust around white dwarfs. And uh, we don't really know if the planets are sort of left over from that first wave of planet formation or if they're caused by a second wave of planet formation that happens um, later in the lifetime of the star or maybe even after the star's main sequence lifetime ends. So uh, that's something that's actually not well understood, but we do know that there are mature planetary systems um, like like dead planetary systems, right? Like stellar remnants that have planets around them that we can detect. Actually, fun fact, maybe some of you know this already, but um, the very first planet that was ever discovered was uh, around a pulsar, which is a stellar remnant. It's not a main sequence star. And um, so often people sort of forget about that or it gets uh, lost in the in the history of the excitement of 51 Peg B and all the stuff that um, that happened later on with radial velocity planet detection techniques, but actually it was pulsar timing that discovered the first planet around another star. Uh, so we've known about planets around stellar remnants from day one. That was that was actually the first type of planet that was ever discovered. Um, oh, okay. There's another question in the chat. Um, what is the greatest distance the radio telescope can resolve? Okay. So um, let's see. There are a few different ways to answer this question. So uh, there's, so I, I guess one way that I will answer this question is, um, to tell you the highest resolution image that Alma has ever been part of. And it's actually part of a larger worldwide effort called the Event Horizon Telescope. So it looks like some of you have heard of this before, right? So this is also a millimeter interferometry technique that combines, um, ALMA, which is really the linchpin of the EHT because it has so much collection area and it's so sensitive compared to the other facilities. There's just nothing in the same class as ALMA. But they connect it with radio telescopes all over the world in Arizona and Hawaii. Greenland now is in there, South Pole Telescope, right? So um, you can combine the light from all of these different telescopes around the world and use it to image uh, 
on event horizon scales, the supermassive black holes at the centers of distant galaxies. And there have been a lot of amazing results there. Um, so those are the highest resolution images that Alma has ever been a part of. Otherwise, um, basically, you can get down to kind of milliarc second scales with Alma. And so depending on the distance that your object is located uh, away from you, that corresponds to different sort of physical scales. Um, so I don't know, Alma is very versatile. You can do all kinds of different science with it from um, planet formation to cosmology to uh, details of the cosmic microwave background, right? There's all kinds of stuff. You can observe basically all different scales in the universe with it. It's pretty awesome. Okay, and then we have another question. Do exoplanet systems have the same rotational direction counterclockwise that our solar system has? Yeah, so... You know, clockwise and counterclockwise is a little bit arbitrary when you're talking about these systems. What physicists would want me to say right now is that the it's really all about the angular momentum vectors. So if you remember the right hand rule from your physics classes, um, right, that that tells you. So you take your right hand and um, you kind of let it go around with the planet forming material and your thumb points in the direction of the angular momentum vector. So for us, where we're talking about counterclockwise rotation, that actually works pretty well with the right hand rule and our vector would be pointing this way. So um, people have actually done studies like this where they've looked at protoplanetary disks in the Milky Way galaxy and kind of asked the question, what do the angular momentum vectors look like? Are they all pointed in a preferred direction or are they kind of at random orientations in three-dimensional space? And the answer is, as far as we can tell, they're pretty random. They, they, they're sort of not a preferred angular momentum vector for these planetary systems. And these molecular clouds with their wreathing smoke-like motions early on in planet formation, um, they sort of wind up fragmenting into different disks with different angular momentum vectors. So there aren't a lot of patterns in which way the angular momentum vectors are pointing. Do any of your stars uh, belong to multiple star systems? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, yeah, actually, this is something uh, that's been a real um, area of investigation, for, especially in protoplanetary disks, is the question of how does planet formation work when you have binary stars? And um, so y'all know probably uh, many, maybe many of you have probably heard that from the Kepler Space Telescope, we've learned about Tatooine type planets, right? Where there's a planet orbiting around a binary star. But the interesting question that we can answer with telescopes like ALMA is, um, how does that work for different stellar separations? Because as you might imagine, what we found actually after doing these studies is that if you have two stars that are really far apart, they can each have their own disk and they can be oriented. Again, the angular momentum vectors can be oriented randomly relative to one another, or they could be aligned. That's a whole topic of investigation. But basically, if you have widely separated stars, they're each going to wind up with their own disk. And then if you have stars that are too close together, they're going to basically function like a single star and you'll get circumbinary disks. And we see both of those configurations. And the question is, what happens in between? Like, what is far apart and what is close together? And so the studies that have looked at this have found that... Um, the uh, the worst possible distance for two stars to be is about 30 AU, which is roughly the scale of the Kuiper belt in our solar system. So if you have one star where the sun is and then you have another star like around where the Kuiper belt is out at 40 AU, that's bad. Um, but if you have them much closer together than that, it's fine and you're just going to get a disk and planets forming around the pair of stars. And then if you have them much farther apart than that, it's fine and you're just they're ju just each going to have their own disks. I imagine relative mass also figures into this as well. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. And how they're orbiting kind of prograde versus retrograde. The outer disk can be truncated a little bit. Like there's all kinds of interesting details there. Um, but, the, but you know, the main message is that as we found from exoplanet surveys, the, proto the disk surveys just um, reinforce this result that planet formation is robust and it's going to happen in most star systems, no matter what the configuration is in one way or another, right? Planets find a way, life finds a way. Um, there are so many different configurations that still result in planet formation. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? We've exhausted the questions. Let's say give folks a chance to put one more chat in and nothing else. It's been fascinating. 
Great. Thank you so much. These are excellent questions. Um, many of them could just be a PhD thesis on their own. <laughs> and some of them have been, actually. <laughs> well, thank you for the wonderful lecture. And was... Thank you guys for being gracious hosts. Thank you once again. Hopefully we can have you back in the classroom at some point. That's oh, much yeah. preferred. Maybe another eight years from now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll have your son give a talk. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the little one, my five-year-old, he's the he's the space nut right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his, uh, his first drawing was a, or his first painting really was a, a purple scribble. And he said, That's a galaxy. I was like, okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. Right. Was his first word lenticular? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then let's wrap it up and get back to the fireplaces. Great. Thank you very much. Again. Very yeah, good talk. Guys. So, uh, thanks for a great talk. That we have our gallery opening tomorrow night. So, if anybody can come out and see it, please do. And I think that is probably it for the night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank so you. Good night. Good night. Good night.